Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. I'd like to welcome you all this morning and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And you know, God's given us a vision. God has given us a vision in his word of what he's going to do, what he is doing. And you know, it's not about anybody's personal vision. It's about God's vision and he's written it down for us so that we can know the times and the seasons we are living in and the importance of the hour. And, and if we have that vision in our heart, it will keep us on the narrow pathway. It, it leads to spiritual Jerusalem and we will not dwell carelessly or be untoward, not knowing where we're going or what we're doing. His, his vision will help us order our steps and we will measure up to that fullness that he desires in each one's life. And, uh, and we can be a part of what God's doing in the earth. And he chose us all for such an hour as this. So delighted to have you, if you're watching online, that you can be a part of what God is doing in the earth. And it's going to take all of us obeying his word, hearing his voice and, um, and being what God would have us to be. And I can't walk your walk, you can't walk my walk, but together as we all just put our hand in his hand and walk with him, because Jesus said, follow me. And so we just want to follow him and he's given us all the directions we need. It's in his book, it's called the Bible. And so we just want to follow him, hallelujah. And so today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called spiritual virgins, spiritual virgins. And firstly, what is a virgin? A virgin is someone who's not had sexual intercourse. They are pure, undefiled and spotless. And if there's a natural virgin, is there a spiritual virgin? Yes, there is. And so we're going to look further into this topic and obtain some spiritual truths from God's word. You know, many Christians already understand that God is preparing a bride who will be made up of many believers. It's males and females because Jesus is the bridegroom. He's going to have a bride and we are to be married to Jesus. Hallelujah. And also many Christians just believe it's automatic to be in the bride. So today we're going to look at some studies from scriptures and just gain a little bit more understanding about that. All right, I'm going to turn King James Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. And we read here in verses 25 to 27. And it says here, Husbands, love your wives. Isn't that a good thing? Husbands, love your wives. And he only meant you to have one wife. All right, he didn't mean to have multiple wives at the same time. There are some nations in this world that think that's okay. But according to God's plan, Adam only had Eve, all right? So one, or at least one at a time. Hallelujah. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, this is God, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he, God, might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what God is doing and that's exactly what is coming to pass. Hallelujah. And only those that are sanctified and cleansed by the washing of the water of the word are those who are going to be without spot or wrinkle or blemish. And they are going to be his bride. Hallelujah. And so what are spots and blemishes? Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we read here in verse 10. Just a few scriptures here. It says here. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak of speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring no railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not. 
and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. They were going to receive a reward of because of their unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So spots, blemishes can speak of people. People. And while they feast with you, where are they feasting? You know, as churches, we come around the communion table and not every heart is uh, fully sanctified, fully purified. And so God's going to, there's going to be a sorting out by his word through his ministries. And even so, we know that God doesn't want anybody to miss out. However, the book says there are going to be spots and blemishes. All right. So, but let it not be us. We want to stay with God's word and allow it to have the uh, adjustment in our lives that it needs to do. All right. If we just turn over to Jude, which is the last book just before the book of Revelation, starting verse 11. And we see here, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain sayings of course. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up, by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know, when we study scripture, we see that the bride of Jesus Christ is shown in type and symbol many times as a virgin. And there's a principle that runs throughout the whole Bible of first the natural and then the spiritual, second the spiritual. So natural Israel and what they experienced and what they went through is an example to spiritual Israel, God's church. So let's just go back to the beginnings, back to Genesis and just look at Ab Abraham, Genesis chapter 24. And Abraham, he actually told his eldest son, sorry, his eldest servant, how to choose a wife for his son, Isaac. And we just read here in Genesis 24, verses 2 to 4. And he says, And Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. The Canaanites, they were the ungodly people. He was not to take a, a, a lady from the ungodly. Verse 4, But thou shalt go unto my country, this is Abraham's country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And Abraham, he's a wonderful type of God the Father. And Abraham's son, Isaac, is a wonderful type of Jesus Christ. And we read what the servant did and what he prayed. Just down in verse 10, reading there. It says, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia and under the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God, my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So he's praying to the Lord. Verse 13, Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, that she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camel, camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. 
and thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. Verse 15, And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her picture on her shoulder. And it says that, you know, we read the story on and she offers to feed the camels or give the camels drink. Camels drink a lot of water. And so she just had such a willing heart, a willing heart. And verse 16, it says, And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled the pitcher and came up. Hallelujah. You know, the one chosen to be Isaac's bride was a virgin. And where was she found? At the well. And the well is where the living waters are and speaks of God's church and the water speaks of God's word. So we need to be in a church where there's plenty of water, of God's word. We don't just want a drip here and a drip there. We want gushes full of God's water. Hallelujah. And then just going forward in scripture, we find out that natural Israel was called the wife of God, whom the Lord later divorced and put her away because of her adulteries, whoredoms and playing the harlot. And, you know, what I'm saying today is this natural Israel are our example. And we're going to find out that they did all manner of things. And as believers, well, I was going to say natural Israel, they committed fornication, adulteries. They, the Lord was no longer their first love. And they just got, they gave their affections and desires to other things, other people, other nations, rather than the Lord. And so we don't want that to happen to us as believers. And so as we read these scriptures, we'll just, um, we can apply them to our lives, that we can take it as a warning, that we don't let these situations occur to us with God's help. And so let's just turn to Hosea. Hosea chapter 1. Let's find Hosea. Hosea. Now, it's after Daniel. <laughs> if you can find Daniel. Hosea chapter 1. Very big. Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2. It says here, The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredoms, departing from the Lord. So here's Hosea being asked to do this, but it was to demonstrate what was taking place in natural Israel. And chapter 2, and verse 2, it says, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife. This is what the Lord's saying of natural Israel. Neither am I her husband. Let her therefore be put away. Put, therefore let her put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. And then we read on further, just uh, Ezekiel. We go to Ezekiel, just a bit back actually, Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 and starting in verse 15. It says here, now this is the Lord speaking to natural Israel. But thou didst trust in thy own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on everyone that passes by. His it was. And of thy garments thou didst take and deckest thy high places with divers colours and playest the harlot thereupon. And like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them. Verse 20. It says here, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of, my, is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? The answer is absolutely not. It's dreadful what's going on. Verse 21, that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. And in all thy abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou was not, when thou was naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, 
says the Lord God. And then verse 26, Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbours, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Yes, and God's not into mixture or abominations. And this scripture, it says, those sort of activities provoke him to anger. Let's read on verse 28. It says here, Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou was unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou was not satisfied therewith. You know, the things outside of God cannot satisfy the heart of man. They're not meant to, and they don't. And verse um, 30, How weak is thine heart, says the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of the imperious whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of of every way and makest thy high places in every street and has not been as a harlot in that thou scornest higher but as a wife that commits adultery so he was saying they weren't just like a prostitute they were worse than that he considered because they were like a wife that commits adultery which takes strangers instead of her husband what a situation and now verse 35 and says wherefore a harlot hear the word of the lord Thus says the Lord, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that has loved whom thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all thy nakedness. Verse 38. And I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. Wow, this is the Lord. This is it. This, this, these are God's standards and... Uh, you know, as believers, aren't we grateful that Jesus came and mercy prevailed? Hallelujah. But until he came, they were under the law and, and you know, judgment was coming straight at them. And it was so bad, God, it was so bad with natural Israel, God gave them a bill of divorcement. Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. And it says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby they back, whereby black, back sliding Israel committed adultery, I had her put away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Back sliding Israel committed adultery. If a person is not pressing on in God, the devil will make sure that they'll be distracted, temptated, tempta tempted, and will turn away from God, turn away from the things of God. They think they're getting away with it, but you know, backsliding happens in the heart before it ever happens in church. It happens in the heart of a person. And so here's God divorcing natural Israel, who whom he originally called his wife. And that is why through Jesus Christ, people need to be born again both Gentile and Jew. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father because everybody outside of Jesus Christ is going to come under such, under such judgment. And again, natural Israel is an example to spiritual Israel, God's church. And meanwhile, in scripture, we read what applied to the natural high priest. And under the law, so we're saying all scripture is profitable. And if we can get hold of this, all the things in God's word have a purpose. And as God gives us understanding and he's writing it on our heart so we get that understanding. So under the law, the natural high priest, when choosing a bride, he had to choose a virgin. And he could not marry, he could not marry a divorced person or someone who had committed fornication or who had committed adultery. 
Let's turn to Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21, reading from verse 10. It says here, verse 10, Leviticus 21, verse 10. And he that is the high priest among his brethren upon whose head the anointing oil is poured and that is consecrated to put on the garments shall not uncover his head nor rent his clothes. Neither shall he go into any dead body nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of God for the crown of the anointing oil of God is upon him. I am the Lord God. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, a profane or a harlot. These shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. All right. So the high priest had to have a virgin. And regarding Jesus, he came to fulfill scripture. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, you know, by now, perhaps, you know, <laughs> the enemy's beating everybody up and saying, look what you've done or look what's happened and look and, and all these. And he's the accuser. But, you know, we, Jesus came. All right. So let's read Jesus about Jesus. Because in Christ, there's no condemnation. All right. So regarding Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, it says, this is what Jesus said. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus came to fulfill all that was written. And it says also in Mark chapter 14, Mark 14, Mark 14 verse 49, says here I was daily with you in the temple teaching this is Jesus saying and you took me not but the scripture must be fulfilled all right so the scriptures also show in Hebrews chapter chapters 3 to 10 that Jesus is our high priest so let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3 Hebrews chapter 3 Hebrews chapter 3 And verse 1, it says here, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. We have been called, all right? Jesus has called us and uh, it's he does the calling, he does the choosing. But he says, consider the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He's our high priest. Chapter 5, verse 10, it says here, you know, speaking of Jesus, called of God, a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek is an everlasting priesthood. Chapter 6, verse 20, it says, Whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we just read here in chapter 7, verse 26, it says, For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled so this is speaking of jesus he's holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens we know jesus mixed with publicans and sinners but in his heart he was separate there was nothing that was going to touch him nothing that was going to sway him for his purpose why he had come to fulfill his father's will and so the book of hebrews also shows the law and the priesthood were a pattern for the new testament church and the priesthood and as believers, we know we are priests, and I'll read it first. And we're also, not only are we priests, we're called to be a holy nation. All right? And it says in 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as holy stones have built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And verse 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation a peculiar special people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we were in the dark and God called us out of the dark to walk in the light. And no matter what the darkness was, whatever degree it was, sin is sin. 
and God's called us to walk in the light and to follow his ways. Hallelujah. And again, natural Israel is an example for spiritual Israel church. So we're just going to go back to the book of Esther. Esther, I'm just going to look that up. Esther, <laughs> Esther, Esther. And it's just after oh, Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther. How's that? Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther. Anything to help. <laughs> Esther, because the book's got 61 books in it, hasn't it, the Bible? Esther, chapter 1, verse 5. And we see here that there was a king, Ahasuerus, and his first wife, Vashti, was put away because she would not come when called. So Esther, chapter 1, verse 5. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto the great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And then verse 9, reading on here. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahum, Bizda, Hebarona, Bigtha, and Abkha, Thepha, and Carcass to the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger was burned within him. You know, the chamberlains can speak of God's ministries, and uh, it sevens the fullness. And so God's ministries are saying, come, come, there's a call going out. And then verse 15, and because and she refused to come. And verse 15, it says, What shall we do then to Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she has not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains. You know, Jesus said, if you love him, we need to obey, keep his commandments. And Vashti disobeyed the king's commandment. And verse 19, it says, And if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment. From him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. I'll just read it. It says in Jesus said in Matthew 23 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered you. Gather thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. It doesn't say they could not come. It just says they would not come. You know, when God's drawing us, we need to be quick to yield, isn't it? When we know God would have us to do something, we need to be quick to obey. Hallelujah. And then we read of Esther becoming the second wife and she was selected among virgins. So chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, it says, And these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let the things for purification be given her. And let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. And we read on, and all the virgins needed to be purified. Reading just down to verse 8. It says, so it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Hegi that Esther was brought along unto the king's house to the custody of Hegi, keeper of the women. All right. And the maiden pleased him and she obtained kindness of him and he speedily gave her the things for purification 
with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to give her were given her out of the king's house and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women verse 10 Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it Esther was from the Jewish and the verse 11 and Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her verse 12 now when every man's maid term was come to go to King Ahasuerus after that she had taken been 12 months according to the manner of women for so it was that the days of her purification were accomplished so it didn't just happen overnight it didn't happen in a blink it took time for the purification to take place and six months of oil of myrrh and six months of sweet odors and the other things for the purifying of the women hallelujah hallelujah she was given things for her purification and we read earlier you know the washing of the water of the word to sanctify us god's given us his word the old and the new testament things for our purification hallelujah and the chosen bride is called by name verse 14 it says and in the evening she went out and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of a sheikh gaz the king's chamberlain which kept the concubines she came into the king no more except the king delighted in her and that she were called by name and verse 15 it says now when the turn of esther the daughter of abihail the uncle of mordecai who had taken her for his daughter was come to go into the king she required nothing but Haggai the king's chamberlain the keeper of the women appointed and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all that looked upon her hallelujah hallelujah verse 17 and the king loved Esther above all the women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti hallelujah so Esther was chosen from amongst all the other virgins and I believe this shows that the bride of Christ who we said is multiple in number male and females is going to be chosen from amongst all the other virgins all the other believers and as I said, the bride of Christ will be multiple in number, not just one person. All right. And I also believe that those that receive salvation. So this is the good news here. Those that receive salvation, e.g. E being born again, are spiritual virgins. It's a new beginning. You're made beautiful inside, outside. It's a new beginning. And as such, we have been a spouse, the scripture says, which means engaged or betrothed to Christ as a virgin. However, only those that have been called by his name and what's his name? Lord Jesus Christ. Where do we get that? Water baptism. And who've been purified by the word, hallelujah, by the word. And whom the king delights in, hallelujah, will be in the bride of Christ. And I'll read it, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. It says, "For I, this is the Lord saying, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So he, as believers, we're, we are engaged. We're already engaged to be married to our husband to be Jesus. And it says as a, we are to be like a chaste virgin to Christ. So we know the virgin means pure, but the oxford dictionary says chaste means decent restrained pure and abstaining from unlawful or immoral sexual intercourse so god wants us to walk the walk holiness holiness is the way any um expression of any physical expression sexual expression is in within the confines of marriage not outside of marriage God ordained marriage. Hallelujah. And the amplified of that 2 Corinthians 11, 2, it says, For I am zealous with you, godly eagerness and, and a divine jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Hallelujah. So the bride of Christ will be absolutely pure. 
And we, let's turn over to Matthew 22 and see what Jesus said. Matthew 22, Jesus said there's an upcoming, spoke of an upcoming marriage. Matthew 22, verses 1 to 3. And it says here, And Jesus answered and spake unto them by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. The certain king, of course, symbolizes God the Father and his son symbolizes Jesus. And so the call is going out. And do we have ears to hear the call and hearts to, respend, to respond to the call, the call to the marriage? And it says in Psalm 34 verse 7, Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And so we need to have that desire in our heart that we want to be in the bride of Christ, not just saved. What God's going to do on the earth is more than just salvation. Salvation's just the beginning of our walk in God. What God's going to do before Jesus comes back, he's going to raise up a glorious church and she's going to be without spot, wrinkle and blemish and she's going to be beautiful. And her ministry is going to be huge, unlike what this world has ever seen. So we want to be part of that. And that's the desire of my heart. And I believe that's the desire of your heart. And in Matthew 24, Jesus goes on and says more. Verse 6, it says, oh, sorry, Matthew 22, reading on there, verses 4. It says, And he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. They killed them, right? Jesus over the years has sent ministries and, uh, and they get killed, murdered, tortured, all dreadful things. But even so, that invitation is going out and some didn't take the invitation seriously and they went on with their own lives and their own ways. And while some others were more interested in their, you know, some were interested in their property, others were, had the, it was all about their business, uh, they just made excuses why they couldn't come to the marriage. And so we just need to make sure that we're not making any excuses as to why we're not drawing close to the Lord. You know, we need to sometimes just take a breath and just consider, make sure we're really pressing into the Lord and not just getting sidetracked or distracted by the things of this world or and it could even be people or our business or so forth and verse 7 to 10 it says and but when the king heard thereof he was wroth and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city which saith to his servants then says he to his servants the wedding is ready but they which were bidden were not worthy go you therefore into the highways and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. The guests are not the bridegroom. Like in the natural, you know, a natural groom and a bride, and then there's all these wedding guests. Well, spiritually, the bridegroom is Jesus, but the bride is multiple and there are going to be wedding guests. Verse 11, reading on, it says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then, he said, to the, then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away. And cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, <coughs> but few are chosen. And again, that certain king, you know, it symbolizes God the Father and Jesus the Son. And we understand from this passage that some were called. They were called, but they just went their own way. And other things in their lives were more important to them than the upcoming marriage. And, 
you know, we need to take this to heart. We need to take this as a warning. I mean, God's word every week, every time we hear God's word, that should challenge us to make sure we're on track, we're pressing in, we really want to be a part of what God's doing. And it should just, you know, keep keep pricking us that we've just got to stay with God, stay with his word, stay with his plan, hallelujah, and not be distracted. And meanwhile, that person who didn't have on the wedding garment, which I believe is the word of righteousness, he was cast into outer darkness. What a dreadful thing. He was in darkness, got saved, didn't have the right garment, garment of salvation, robe of righteousness, put out into darkness. Dreadful. And darkness is a place separated from God forever. And then let's turn over to Luke chapter 14. We read a similar passage, Luke 14. Verse 16 to 24, it says here, or 16, 16 to, we'll just start reading, verse 16. It says here, Luke 16, verse, sorry, verse, chapter 14, verse 16. Then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they, were, they all, with one, one consent, began to make excuse. The first one said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see to it. I pray there for have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Again, they made excuses. You know, one was a property developer. Another had a farm with livestock and another man, he'd married a wife and perhaps she was having all the say. Any excuse at the end of the day is not going to be acceptable because Jesus desires to be number one in our heart and our lives. Reading on verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being very angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those that were bidden shall taste of my supper. It's a warning, isn't it, to us all? You know, we, it's not how we start our walk with God. We have to go all the way through. Hallelujah. And we are in the end times. And now is the time to draw near to God and ensure that he has first place in our heart and our life. Now's the time. And also we only have today. And what if today was our last day? What if we took our last breath today? We need to make sure we're up to date with the Lord every day. But thankfully, it's not our last day today because God's got even more wonderful things ahead for us. So we want to be a part of that. That's the desire of our heart. Okay, and the timing of this wedding, when's it going to be? It's going to happen at midnight. Let's turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Reading from verse 1. And it says here, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. So they're going forth to meet the bridegroom. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, like we have to have patience in our walk with God. We can't just snap our fingers. We, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept and remember backsliding it's a condition it's a spiritual condition sleep speaks of being backslidden they just you know just got off the boil just got off doing other things you know verse six and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out 
But why, the wise answered, say, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. The, the cost, Jesus paid the price, but the cost for us is our self-life. We have to buy for ourselves. Verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready, we've got, to, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And but he answered verily, I sound you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. The bride of Christ is not asleep. On my natural wedding day, I was not asleep. I was getting ready, you know, got the hair done, get the dress, get the jewelry, get the getting myself ready, right? And even before the day of the wedding, there was preparation. Things had to be booked, the cars, the, the reception place, things had to be booked, the bridesmaid, the groomsmen, everything had to be organized. There was a preparation and there were things on the day. And the bride of Christ is not asleep. She is looking expectantly, looking to her soon coming bridegroom. He's coming all right and he's coming right on time. And we need to be prepared and ready. And as I said, sleep speaks of being back sitting in heart and just being away from God, just away from God, away from church, just away, you know. And the foolish virgins, you know, they had no close ongoing relationship with the bridegroom. God, it's a relationship. We're not talking about religion. It's a relationship. And in the natural, adults get married. Adults get married. And adults get married to the person they love. And so to only spiritual adults will get married to Jesus Christ, the one whom they love. And in this scripture, we see here that the timing of this wedding is at midnight. And we are in the midnight hour, which is just before Jesus' return. It's a, there's, there's a timing and there's a ministry of the bride and there's and the other ministries and there's a timing and what they're going to do before Jesus comes back. And we know that the lamp speaks of the word of God. <coughs> the virgins had lamps. Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. It's God's word, right? And the oil speaks of the anointing and the Holy Spirit's been given to lead and guide us into all truth, to order our steps. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word of God to us so we can find our way, hallelujah, to the marriage, to be part of it all, hallelujah. And I'll just read a scripture. It's in Psalm 45. Well, we should turn to it. Psalm 45, just so you can see it. Psalm 45, and we read here in verse 13 and 14. Psalm 45, 13 and 14 says here, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in a raiment of needlework and virgins, the virgins, her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee. So there were, there's the king's daughter speaking of the bride and other virgins are going to follow. And whereas we see that the foolish virgins, they'd gone to sleep. Why? Because they had no anointing. They had no spiritual knowledge. There was no discernment and there was no awareness of the importance of the hour. They didn't take it seriously, the hour that we are in. They just, just maybe just shrugged their shoulders. This is not a time to be switching off. This is a time to be switching on. Hallelujah. And to provide more understanding of that passage in Matthew 25, we're just going to read what the Westminster Bible Dictionary says concerning the custom of marriage. It actually gives you understanding. So I'll just read it. It says, when the day appointed for the wedding arrived, the bride bathed, put on her white robes, often richly embroidered, decked with jewels, fastened with the indispensable bridal girdle about her waist, covered herself with a veil and placed a garland on her head. The bridegroom arrayed in his best attire with a handsome headdress and a garland on his head, set out from his home for the house of the bride's parents, attended by his friends, accompanied by musicians and singers. And if the procession moved at night, by persons bearing torches. So at midnight hour, it's dark, right? So you're going to need torches. You're going to need the word. 
Having received his bride, deeply veiled from the parents and with their blessing and good wishes of friends, he conducted the whole party back to his own or his father's house with song, music and dancing. And on the way back, they were joined by maidens, friends of the bride and groom. So the maidens came after the bride and groom. And so we see here that the maidens, the virgins, were not the bride. The bride and the bridegroom went into the house. Hallelujah. And even though the others later, even though the others came later, they were the virgins, the wise virgins. They went in as wedding guests to the wedding feast. But the foolish virgins, they couldn't enter in because they were too late. The door was shut. So now we understand there is a bride group virgins. There's also wise virgins who make it in as wedding guests. And there are foolish virgins who miss out on the wedding and the marriage supper altogether. So which group do you desire to be in? Let's turn to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. It says here, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of of the saints right she made herself ready hallelujah jesus wife will make herself ready it's our responsibility to wash in the water of the word that's supplied by the ministries god's given us his word and the ministries are to break the word you remember jesus when he was feeding the five thousand, he broke and he gave it to the disciples and then they gave it right the ministries are to break the bread so it's palatable, so we get it, so it goes into our heart, hallelujah. And, uh, sh and so we need to be gleaning the word of God, amen. And, you know, Jesus said, gather the manna every day. It wasn't, they had to gather six days a week and on that sixth day, and we are in the sixth day of God's calendar, if you can say it that way, and there's a double portion of the word available. There's a double portion of the word of God available for those that are hungry, for those that will go and get it, who, those who want the word of God, who understand that it's the word of God, it's the washing of the word of God that's going to cleanse their heart, that's going to prepare them for what's coming. To be a part of the bride, there's going to need a double portion of the word. Hallelujah. And it's coming. It's there. It's We're in the sixth day. There's plenty of word. We just need to have ears to hear it, ears to hear it and hearts that want to understand it. Lord, give us bread. Give me understanding. Lord, it's me. I want it. I want understanding of your word. Lord, I'm hungry for you. Is that in our heart? We need that in our heart. Lord, and if it's not there, Lord, put it in my heart. Put that hunger for your word. Put that hunger for your presence. Put it in my heart, Lord, so I can be a part of all that you're doing because I don't want to miss out. And I don't believe you do either. All right. So it's, as I said, it's our responsibility to wash in the water of the word. And the water of the word, it will deal with any unclean flesh because all roads lead to the heart and it's the word of God that washes our hearts clean. We're saved by the blood, but it's the word of God that washes our hearts so that we will be without spot, wrinkle or blemish. And so as we are fully prepared for the marriage, all right, we want to be fully prepared. Imagine in the natural, if I was uh, going down the aisle in my dressing gown, wouldn't that look ridiculous, right? Well, I tell you what, a lot of people haven't got the clothing on yet. They've got not, some of them, of course, we know unsaved yet haven't even got the garment of salvation. But we need that robe of righteousness that is put on the outside because of what God's doing on the inside. As for me, I will um, be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. I want that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're seeking him. He's, it's his word. He is the Lord, our righteousness. We're seeking him. All right, so Revelation, we're in 19, verse 7, 8. Let me read it from the Amplified. It says, Let us rejoice and shout for joy, exulting and triumph. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor. For the marriage of the Lamb at last has come, and his bride has prepared herself. 
She has been permitted to dress in fine, radiant linen, dazzling and white, for the fine linen it signifies and represents the righteousness, the upright, just and godly living deeds and conduct and right standing with God of the saints, God's holy people. So hallelujah. So Jesus is the righteousness of God revealed. Jesus' wife will be clothed with righteousness. He is righteous and she is growing up into that righteousness so that when she grows up into that fullness, that full spiritual maturity, she will be just like him. And that's what they call marriage when it's a joining of perfection. Jesus is perfect and he said, be you perfect. And so as she grows up, she will be perfect as well, fully in his righteousness. Amen. And it says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness and they shall be filled. So we need to hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. And so we need to stay hungry and thirsty for God's righteousness. That's his word. Hallelujah. All right. I just want to put this last bit in at the end of this. Just to give some further understanding of scripture. From within the bride group, after she is married, they call that the day of atonement. She will be spiritually one with Jesus. And within that bride group will come. So from within the bride group will come the revealing, the release of the sons of God. And they will perform their ministry. A woman in the natural knows when she's going to give birth. Well, the church is multiple in number. The bride of Christ will be multiple in number and they will bring forth the sons of God. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. It says here, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And let's just turn over to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, and we're speaking here of the 144,000, verses 4 and 5. Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5, it says he, and speaking of them, it says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, so they're, they're natural people, right? And, and being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile. So there's no deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Hallelujah. And so as we've learned, as we've been born again, these, they, as we've been born again, we are spiritual virgins. We are pure. And we just see here though that Women can speak of churches and false doctrine can defile a person. We just read here that these are undefiled. If you wash in muddy water, you'll get dirty. We need to wash in the pure water. God's word is pure. And we read here that this passage, it says they're virgins and they are they have not been defiled. So they haven't had a mixture of other doctrine mixing up. God's word is pure. And it does what it needs to do in our hearts. So we just need to be aware what we what listen to, what we're watching, what we're gleaning from. It is the body of Christ, but we just need to make sure everything lines up with the scripture. Hallelujah. And there's many wonderful ministries in the body of Christ we just need to keep our eyes on the word. Amen. And it says um, of, these, of this group that they follow the lamb. 
And Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. And this group are without fault before the throne of God. And I'll just read it from the Amplified. It says, these are they who have not defiled themselves by relationships with women, right? Women speak of churches, for they are pure as virgins. These are they who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These are they who have been ransomed, purchased, redeemed from among men as the first fruits for God and the lamb. No lie was found to be in their lips, for they are blameless, spotless, untainted, without blemish before the throne of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in summary, with God's help, now is the time to be hungry and thirsty for God's word of righteousness so that as virgins, we will spiritually grow up and become all that God desires for us to be for his glory. And everyone said, Amen.